uh, 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever the world you're watching from, and happy Good Friday. It's uh, Business Morning live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. It's, uh, it's another Easter holiday as Christians all around the world celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, celebrations appear to be on a low key as the state of the economy takes its toll on the purchasing power of many Nigerians. Well, our business correspondent, uh, Willie Bong, took a survey of how the high cost of commodities has impacted, uh, have impacted individuals. To take a listen. In the past uh, 40, 45 days, we've been facing uh, the hike in our uh, diesel. You know, most of these fishing companies, they go to the high sea with diesel. On a daily basis, you have a vessel that is uh, consuming a 2,500 liters of diesel per day. And when they have to come back, those costs will go on the product they are landing with, which is, which is the fish. Things are very expensive now. Even the rice we used to get about 20 something thousand now, it's up to 35,000 now, going to 40,000. So many customers, they have been complaining. If they come, they can't buy the goods. They say, that is not my budget. So we are stranded in this market. There's no custom anymore because our things is very expensive. But what the federal government will do is, at least the old price we are in before is more better than now. So at least they can reduce the price of the goods. So they can be able to, for customers to buy. If you buy something for like, let's say, 5,000, maybe a cup, now it will, not, it will be like half cup. So things are really bad, like the prices of things have really skyrocketed. All right, so, uh, well, quite uh, a grim uh, picture painted. But we have uh, with us in the studio, uh, Jibin Mohammed, Head Supply Logistics, uh, Mile 12 International Market. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the program today. Good morning, Mr. Lady. Good morning. So, well, inflation was already a problem, you know, before uh, the war in Ukraine started, and that has even stoked, you know, inflation more globally. You know, but before you... What is uh, impacting prices more in Nigeria? Um, good morning. Um, the issue of um, hike of food price, uh, which has been uh, norms in the country since December last year, it's uh, been a growing issue which has affected mostly all commodities in the country, which is due to the increase of fuel price, which is something that is uncontrollable in the nation as take up right now. And um, also, we have issues of headers clashes, the farmers clashes as well, which has caused a very major problem in issue of um, supply of foodstuffs in the market. Quite interesting, but you know, you're, you're a player, you know, in that market, you're part of the team. Uh, you know, can you paint a picture of what it's really like, you know, in the market for you? Yeah, in the market, there's a control system. We're trying to, we initiate actually a program, a system in which we're trying to cope this issue of um, scarcity and insecurity due to the global, uh, due to the high cost of food. So we place a system in which that in every nooks and cranny of the nation where farmers are, we try to extend our support to them in terms of transportation, which is one of the major problem they are facing because bringing food down to the south or to any other part of the country is uh, is the main is a major problem farmers are facing because we have a subsidy we have our own trucks that we use to supply foods down to to the south here which at least has reduced drastically to about 30 percent when it comes to issue of um, transportation so with that at least we've done something better and um Kundus to the chairman of the market, which I think he sacrificed over like 15 trailers, which bring foodstuffs to the market almost weekly. So uh, we do partner also with other third parties, which when they come in, we try and subsidize to traders as well. Okay, if in times of trader needs to pay a high amount of money, there's a tax that they do pay, so the market also cover for that aspect as well. So uh, when it comes to, you know, tax on... Uh, traders in the market, they're getting, you know, some relief. Yeah, definitely they are. They are. So, Especially when it comes to issue of payoff, when it comes to after the review of their product to the market, we in the, in the supply section, we go and monitor all these products. When we monitor them, we find out that 
when we, the marketers complain, while the customers come to the market, they complain of everything is expensive. So we, we sat down and we make some, some analysis. Okay, if we have collecting taxes from the marketers and uh, um, also revenues from the, from, the trucks, from the trucks coming into the market, what can we do to subsidize? The, the market price from the farmers and to the dealers also. But what we think is for the price control, I think we are trying really, really high, really, really, we are trying so well, so much to say that we'll cover those lapses that has to do with hike in, in foodstuffs. Right, but you know, compared to uh, last uh, Easter, you know, and, and this uh, particular one, how would you describe, you know, demand? Yeah, demand is always high when it comes to festivity period. And um, whenever it's festivity period, the increase of supply increases more due to high demand. And um, it falls back to the market. This is where we are having issues because by the time we supply perishable product to the market, if we are uh, on a normal day, we supply, let's say, like 20 trucks to the market, we're during festive period, we supply, we we'll double our supply due to high demand. So, with this, with this high demand, you find that also, due to the economy, you find that people trooping into the market are less. They are not much, unlike before, because the economy is not helping, because the savings people are having is not increasing. Rather, they spend more. So these are one of the challenges. Our major challenge, after we deliver, we bring in excess, and it gets deteriorating. This is one of the problems we are also facing as well. So this thing deteriorates. How can we be able to cope this problem? Is one of our major problems that we are facing, and we are trying to look for a way to solve that problem. That's an well. uh, issue of uh, storage. You issue know. of storage. Uh, yes. What kind of uh, you know conversations are you having? You know regarding you know getting more storage you know facilities so that these uh, foods don't go bad. You know if if you if you don't make the sale, you know in due time. Yes. Um, you see, what we we are producing mostly our perishables. These are where we're having problems from. And uh, when it's come to issue of cash crops, such as um, arable products, such as maize and corns and all of that, we're having problems as well. For instance, now, for instance, the perishable products, whenever they've been harvested, the only thing you can do, you just need to take them to the market and sell. This is a traditional way. This is what we have been doing. Okay, which system can we bring in? Which method can we bring in to stop this wastage? is two method. It's either by preservation, which is through drying, or preservation through coat system. This is a very huge capital that an individual cannot do. The stakeholders in the market won't have that capacity to do. Though we've implemented about, um, let's say, 20 to 50 feet uh, coat room, but it can't contain nothing less than two trailers. This is a place that we can, in a week, you find that we are wasting product up to like four to five trailers getting to about um, 300 metric tons. So how can we be able to get this product down to the market, down to the farms? And also, this has to do from right from the point of, uh, from the farm to the point of delivery. Why coming also, some of the trucks are using other refrigerator trucks for the, for, the, for the perishables. So we need refrigerator trucks that can be able to preserve this product directly from the farm, directly to the warehousing, which there's a system which the chairman is bringing in right now that has to do with the coaching system, but it's not something that's going to be very big. It's something that's going to be simple because it's actually capital intensive. By the time I want to preserve my tomato, I want to preserve my pepper, there are some, there are some products that you can't preserve. Rather, you preserve, you preserve them through drying. Okay, these are some things that we also need to bring to the market. People should get used to dry perishables as well. They are also good. They are as good as using fresh, fresh. but not, not actually have good, um, high quality like the fresh, but they are as good as. The only percentage, the ingredient percentage is low compared to, to the fresh ones. Yes, mostly we see uh, buyers always wanting the fresh, the fresh, ones, fresh, yes. fresh, fresh, mm -hmm. you know, when they uh, come to the market. But, you know, talking about, you know, uh, uh, so storage facilities being capital intensive and all that. Are there any conversations around funding, you know, at this time, you know, you know, with the banks and, you know? Yes, um, there was a program that was held in the markets by UK Aid that was around um, four to five years ago. So after the program, we went on training on how to preserve and um, 
on how to go with the market situation, how to control price, which is one of the major issues why we went on that program. Um, after having the training, we were taught on how to control a pricing from beginning of the year to the end of the year. How can we do that? We need interventions. And some of these interventions that we need has to come into the government. Well, can the government do all? There are some organizations also that need to come in and support. They channel their attention to the wrong direction. There are stakeholders in the market. We have dealers in the market. We have farmers in the market. We have people that are used to these perishable stuffs. There are stakeholders that they are to meet. You can just get a firm, you, like for instance, Bank of Agriculture, they give farmers loan, but at the end of it, where is the farming? You find out that people they give all this loan and all these grants are not the right people that they deserve this grant from. And there are other things also, issue of this uh, preservation also. How are you going to preserve? when you've been given grants and nothing is on ground. So mostly, I think they need to channel their attention, most of these organizations, they need to turn their, their, their attention towards the stakeholders that are into the real business. They might think, okay, people in the market are not knowledgeable enough, but I think they are knowledgeable in their fields. It might be maybe they are not educated, but they produce, they are the producers. They feed the nation. Why not go to them? They are the roots. They know where the thing is coming from, and they know where, where to take it to. So what are, you, what are you, you know, doing, you know, regarding identifying these people, you know, that actually need uh, these funds? Are you having, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, conversations or a database that, you know, these are the people that need to get these funds? How do we reach them? Yes, you see, um, like for the market, we have sections. And for each section, we have a database for each section. Each section is categorized based on grains, based on perishables as well. And all these grains are subclasses. We have the one for beans, we have the one for rice, we have the one for millet as well. And for the perishables also, we have the one for carrots and other perishables. All are in sections, and all of them have their database. So we know who to channel the issues to, we know who are the farmers, we know the dealers, and we know the consumers. So we know who the grants needs to be given to, and we know who needs help. So, because we've been in this system for over 40 years. So I just came in recently, and our parents have been there for over 40 years, and the chairman also has been there for over 30 years. So I believe there's a very vast experience when it comes in terms of production, agro-food um, in the market. So they can do well, and they I can extend um, more than giving other people that are not in the feed or they are not into the business grant, I think it's better you should look at the stakeholders in the market. The stakeholders, right. But, you know, supply chain issues have, you know, been going on, you know, globally. Uh, we've seen disruptions, you know, uh, with the food supply chains and all of that. How is it looking, you know, in, in your, uh, in your uh, business? Yes, um, it's affecting. But right, I, like I said the other time, we tried to put a shock absorber towards that by introducing a subsidy. Let me say a subsidy in this aspect, a subsidy by the chairman himself. Um, voluntarily, voluntarily sacrificing over trucks of um, 40, 450 metric trucks is something huge. For you to be able to control your market, for you to be able to get your product, from locality, from remote areas. It's something big he has already done already. So what we are looking at is we need another support, in, especially when it comes to issue of transportation. Especially issue of transport has been a major problem when it comes to delivery. And apart from that also, when you look at, uh, when you look at the production, the cost of producing all this product, has this thing increased or reduced? Some might say it has reduced due to insecurity, but some might say it has increased due to what? Awareness of how agriculture is going on. The, the federal government has really um, tried so much, has really boost the economy when it comes to agriculture, but have this been channeled to the right direction? This is the question. Has the federal government or the organization in charge, have they channeled their attention to the right direction, where the grants need to be taken to, 
who are to do the work, who are to produce the foodstuffs. Right. And, you know, uh, let's look at food security. Now, we've seen the Food Agriculture Organization, you know, have a bleak, you know, outlook when it comes to food security. You know, we've seen how much uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine actually provide, you know, when it comes to food and, you know, fertilizers and input, you know, uh, into fertilizers. And, you know, looking at the situation in Nigeria, you know, right now, how are you seeing, what's your outlook for food security at this point? Yes, um, if we are to reference our condition with um, Russia or European countries or USA, I think we are not on the right side. We have to take our system. We have to build a system. What we are talking about, the developed country, they have a system which they work with. And we, normally, we work on the traditional way. We don't have a system in, in our country. So by the time we say we want to copy um, Russia or any European countries, I think we are failing because we have not of the same, we don't have a system already. We don't really have a system. So definitely we need to build a system within us. And um, apart from that also, which is a major problem when it comes to issue of production or um, impact due to the rising of um, this crisis and all of that, for security, we actually where we have our major challenges is issue of um, importation of herbicides. We have um, what we actually need for production of foodstuffs are three major products, the farm, the fertilizer, and the herbicides. We, we have the farm. We have, I think Nigeria is almost like the ninth nation in the world which have an arable farm for farming, which I think we produce and we supply to neighboring countries. I particularly go to Benin Republic, go to Ghana, and go to Cameroon. We supply product to all these neighboring countries from Lagos, not from the north. And from the north also extend their tentacles to other neighboring countries, Niger and Chad as well. So I think Nigeria has the capacity. The issue of food security needs to be controlled by we. We shouldn't reference our issue with, uh, with the European countries or the developed country. It's something we can tackle if only we can produce the herbicides, which is a major problem because we are producing fertilizers now. And um, another issue, again, we are having price controlling as well. We are producing fertilizer, but it's better for me to import fertilizer from outside country, which is quite cheaper for me. What is causing all this problem? Is it the taxation? they got from the fertilizer company in the country? Could it be due to exchange rates? What are the major problems? These are things that we have to put in place and the government needs to do a very big assignment on issue of fertilizer being produced in the country. Why someone bring fertilizer outside the country is sells cheaper than someone producing in the country. And you know, we've seen you know, a couple of countries actually you know, told the uh, food protectionism yeah. you know, uh, line at this point, but I see you guys are still you know, selling uh, food commodities to other countries at yes. this point. Is that a good move? Yes, we, we, we actually do that. It, it's a good move. It's a good move for, because uh, what I'm saying, uh, what, what we're looking at is most of this country, you, you can't do without partnership with other countries. Definitely, if you want to boost your economy, you want to actually have source resource of incomes and you want to actually have um, an exchange product. Some of these products you take out of the country, like issue of China now. Um, when you take some product out of China, some don't really actually make it with cash. They don't come with, uh, with cash back. They instead, they exchange with herbicides, bring it down to the country. So I think it's a good move by doing a trading, a butter trading with country. You exchange product together, and which actually give us a, um, a reduction in terms of costs, uh, efficiency as well. All right. Well, it's a holiday. Let's uh, hope uh, everyone is being fed, you know, at this point. Thank you so much, Mr. Jibin Sanya Mohammed, uh, Head Supply Logistics by 12 International okay. Market. It was great having you. Uh, you. You're giving us your holiday. Thank Come you. on the program. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, after the break, we uh, take a look at what's happening in Nigeria's economy, looking at uh, outlook from uh, rating agencies, looking quite bleak at this point. We're having that conversation in a moment. Do stay with us.
All right, now to our next conversation. Global Credit Ratings uh, Agency, Fitch, has cut Nigeria's economic growth forecast for 2022 by almost half, uh, citing an unexpected unexpect, contraction in the oil and gas sector, uh, rising inflation, and little progress with economic reforms. Fitch now expects Africa's largest economy to grow by 1.8% this year compared to an earlier uh, forecast of 3%. That's more pessimistic. And World Bank and the IMF's forecast of 2.5 and 2.7 percent, respectively. Well, joining us now is uh, Orji Demezwe, CEO of Flame Academy, joining us today in the studio. Great to have you. Good morning. And, good morning. Uh, happy um, Good Friday. Friday. Yeah, I wish you the same. Good Friday. <laughs> it's a wonderful day for Christians all over the world. Exactly. The day of passion uh, leading to the resurrection of Christ. Exactly. So we are uh, rejoicing. Uh, that uh, we are saved through Christ. Yes, even you. though uh, we see uh, it's rising prices, you know, we're what not able to celebrate <laughs> uh, the way most people would want to. Yeah, you know, sure. With all of um, that chicken and turkey. It's a big and, issue. Yeah. This um, a period where people travel, you know, particularly exactly. my people from the east. We travel to uh, be with family, to buy things, cook for your family and for other uh, friends and, you know, other family uh, members, relatives and so on. But unfortunately, one, people are not traveling mm. because of security concerns. I've had a number of people whom I asked, are you going to be downtown? It's usually time we catch up yeah. now and uh, maybe sometimes in August during the New Year Festival and then December during Christmas. But this year, this Easter is happening at a very low uh, level, low, at low key, yeah. you know, and a big, it's a, big, a bit of concern. And this is time economy tends to, you know, experience a lot of uh, domestic consumption right. and ramp up of activities. But here, it's not happening. And globally, too, Quite we're seeing yeah. uh, incomes, you know, being uh, going down. Yeah. High level of unemployment, you know, uh, household incomes have come to very uh, low level. And even when you are earning something, the power of that um, income is going down every day uh, due to inflation. Even though we have a figure that appears to have been declining, you know, in the past few months, uh, now down to 15.7. But reality in the market does not suggest so. Right. Yeah. So it's even a big, in the UK, it's a big issue, yeah. what are talking to. You know, one of our correspondents there said that uh, most of the consumers there say when they get into the supermarket, it feels higher. Much, it feels much like higher than double-digit, you know, inflation. That's in the UK. Okay. You know, uh, you know, at this point. But now, you know, for a UK that has even the more accurate figures compared to Nigeria, right? You know, so it's much, much higher there here than what we see in the official records of inflation. The and realities it's quite sad. of the numbers. Quite sad. Anyway, we're seeing that these uh, rating agencies, the the, the outlook. It's quite, you know, uh, bleak at this point. Yeah, there's every reason for... How are you seeing it? Right. Uh, I quite agree that Nigeria has to be a bit more careful and more strategic in handling its economy this year. All right? Earlier on, uh, the World Bank IMF had actually had to also bring down their own, um, you know, outlook and inspiration for Nigerian economy. And Nigeria itself has been very optimistic. In our budget, we are looking at somewhere 4.2, something very high, quite in a, a long departure, a far departure from what others think about us. And now Fitch is saying 1.8 or below 2%. And mind you, these figures are you know, below our current uh, 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 population growth rate, meaning that if we um, you know, grow our population more than our economy, people are every day sliding into abject poverty. Okay, be that as it may, uh, I, I want to agree that Nigeria has to be a bit more careful if we want to experience any significant growth in our economy this year. Because one, this is an election year, okay, when you see a lot of uh, economic activities, budget decisions being stalled, um, uh, capital expenditure spend, and similar things being held on because of uh, you know, um, the challenge of election. So that's a major minus for our economy. And you see a, a, a more daring uh, a fight or a more daring attempt by the bandits, uh, terrorists, and all the distractors trying to hold activities down in this economy. The recent event, you know, the train attack in Abuja right. being a major point by this terrorist to say, don't go anywhere. We're going to wait for you, whether at the airport or the train or by, or by road. Even Kaduna Airport was also attacked, even though the news about that was you know, a bit managed. So if you're not able to move around, people are not moving around. Goods and services are not moving around. People cannot even travel for Easter. The economy is highly endangered. Activities are going to come to you know, a halt or to you know, a slow. And when that happens, it impacts heavily on the gross domestic product and people's ability to produce and sell goods and services. So if you look at that, insecurity, an election year, uh, a country which should be earning a lot, a lot more 
through the uh, oil and gas uh, sales. But as we end a lot there, we're also uh, proposing higher level of uh, subsidy, four trillion, which of course is uh, inevitable. But we haven't done enough to convince the Nigerian masses that we can remove the subsidy and people will be uh, uh, okay with that. So if you look at that and the fact that, you know, we're also right now filtering our oil receipts in our so-called egotic defense of the Naira, out of ego, we want Naira to stay fairly stable, and we forget the long-term benefit of trying to find a, a, a decent and a economically realistic level for a Naira exchange. How can you, for goodness sake, uh, sell uh, the dollar at uh, about 416 today in the INA window, and you know, in the other markets where people now go to find solutions to their problems, it's going for almost 600 Naira. How can you do that? It's a recipe for danger. And that's why IMF has said Nigeria has failed to carry out some important uh, reform. Not that we, we support total uh, implementation of IMF's uh, you know, uh, recommended uh, reforms, but we must do something pragmatic. When you are hurting, when a patient is hurting out of a very big illness like cancer or any of those uh, chronic or terminal diseases, you don't solve it by keep, you know, applying uh, analgesic all the time, Panadol. Uh, ibuprofen, all of that, continuously, without having a plan to conduct the surgery that's required to solve that problem on a long-term basis. What Nigeria has continued to do, due to lack of bold leadership, both at the central bank and, you know, the national level, even though I acknowledge that the central bank governor is doing his best. So I won't pass the blame to him, but you also have a share of it, because, I mean, if you can't do what you should do in a particular position, there's something to do. You can, you know, um, uh, give up and go and, to later. And, and the central about... bank today in Nigeria does not have uh, what you call um, autonomy. And that's why we have 416 and 600. If you ask me the consequences, I will tell you. Now, what we're doing is to subsidize this, uh, you know, to make this currency free for people who can access it through their connections in central bank and the federal, and the federal government, and then they can easily, you know, uh, what do you call it again, round trip this currency in the other market. And because of that, you know, you're encouraging a lot of bad behavior, inefficient allocation of this uh, scarce U.S. dollar uh, resource and so on, and then you also for that discouraging export. An exporter who has suffered to go to the bush to find the resources and sell them, he brings the money in, you force him to sell at 416. Somebody who has no, done no job at all whatsoever in the economy will grab that money one way or the other and then sell it at 600, making a margin of almost 170 for doing nothing. So if he, has, if he happens to have a connection in central bank or federal government, Aso Rock or anywhere, and he grabs $1 million, you know, through that uh, window. Of what they normally document for whatever business they want to do, but you and I know that they're not going to do that business. The, 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 a million dollar means the guy sits at his home, drinking coffee, laughing at the country, and making a hundred, a hundred something million naira. He Just does like that a, a week or two, he, he's fine. So, so it encourages, it, it, you, it, know, it encourages uh, that, you know, bad uh, behavior, behavior. You know, and you know, uh, inefficient allocation, and that is not good for this economy. So while we are trying to boost our ego that our currency is not badly priced, Nigeria we are still defending, even though that defense has not led us anywhere in the past years. We are progressively gone from 180 to 225 to two, and we keep making the argument we are defending Naira. How much have we achieved that defense in the past five years? So does not tell you that we're not doing something right. We don't want to do a surgery. Surgery is painful. When you conduct that surgery, the economy will shake a bit. It goes inflation, quite invasive. Inflation will jump through the window temporarily and all of that. But what happens eventually, the patient, after the pain of the surgery, begins to recuperate, begins to get better over time, and you achieve your long-term objective. When well, we get it right with the currency market, what do you find? The avenues for inflow. The international money um, uh, transfer agencies, you know, uh, diaspora uh, transfers into Nigeria, and several other sources, even foreign investors, will we, we begin to flow in their money. The money market investors, like what you call the portfolio investors, you know, can't come in today in Nigeria because they are not sure at what rate they can take their their returns, you know, out. If you bring in a million, it, a million seems, it seems quite straightforward. But at the end of the day. It, it's it, difficult it, to implement these uh, things. It's quite hard so to So when you implement. resolve this issue, you bring in more investors, and CBN will no longer be the major source of uh, you know, foreign exchange. Several other uh, sources of supply will, will open up. So it's a supply problem, and we don't want to solve it on a long-term basis. And then when you also normalize the rate, you find foreign investors coming in, both the, um, the direct investors and portfolio investors. They start coming in. We are subject to insecurity uh, uh, issues. Right. When you do that, exporters, everybody wants to go to the bush to find something he can export. Once you teach him how to package it, 
you know, how to, um, you know, find market, uh, you know, uh, across, uh, you know, uh, Europe, America, and, and even within Africa. With the AFTA, that's the African uh, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Yeah, yeah. With that, Nigeria can earn a lot of uh, dollars through export. When you encourage exporters to, you know, uh, go there and find the resort to, to export. Today, when you have, um, you know, a currency that's not so strong, you have to deploy every resource towards making people export. Japan has done that several years. Japan has deliberately many times, you know, um, uh, tried to deny themselves, you know, you know, strengthening of their own uh, uh, yen, just so that they could boost export. Now, but but doing... there was an impressive uh, update we got uh, yesterday about the customs. Uh, we, we saw non-oil exports actually go about 59 it, uh, It's billion. going up now gradually because yeah. people are also all together, you know, um, uh, stock. You know, people are frustrated, they're looking, uh, you know, uh, one way or the other to make money. I'm just saying that if we can achieve export growth, even with this condition, how much more when the exporter is going to come in, you know, and earn so much from his export? You know, what we're doing now is to shortchange the exporter and promote the importer. The importer who comes to report, I'm importing something worth 7 million. Meanwhile, what they actually need is 3 million. And then through whatever kind of documentation, they get the seven million and make so much money in selling that for one, you know, that's a cheap money from central bank, you know, and, and that you find that even people who are doing genuine business who want to import cannot import today. Some days ago, I had a discussion with a, a genuine uh, customer who I've known for several years, and they bring in approved products, but they have had requests at the central bank over the months for FX. They can't get it. But now banks have a long queue. Customers stay, you know, months looking for, you know, decent, you know, legal and, you know, approved transaction, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 for, uh, currency to bring in their import. So even genuine importers, those that the CBN has, you know, them, you know, approved that they are in the white list, not the uh, banned or, you know, uh, restricted for two items or whatever number of items. These ones are doing the ones that you approve, and yet they line up. Asking you for you know uh, this currency, they can't find it right. because supply is highly limited. Right. How do we open up supply of USD to the country? How do we ensure that those who can because part of the way to open up supply is to encourage exporting. Now we don't have exporters fighting to get this, and when they export, trust me, the export proceeds that should come in here are usually diverted through whatever kind of documentation, shell companies, and so on. Let me not say some things here. Right. You, you find that exporters cannot even bring their money here because they are being maltreated when they bring it here at 4 or 6. When they know that they pay their own cost of operation, they, meet, they, they have to catch up with their operational cost based on 585, 600 per dollar. So at, the at some point, a unified you know, uh, rate would... The central bank must find a way to close that gap. 416 versus 480 is a no-no. You, they must find a way, even if it means, some of us, when we talk about uh, devaluation, we, we sound like the enemy of this country. But what have we done in the past five, six years? From 200 to 600, okay, let's even say 200 to 400, what do you call that? It is a devaluation. So we're not waking up at all. We are not acting proactively in the way we manage this economy. We are always trying to catch up. The central bank has, over, over the past two, three years, tried to do what you call tactical devaluation. But what has been happening is forced depreciation because we have refused to take the wrong decision. I always refer to Egypt, who had the same problem with us in 2016, when we had you know, uh, oil price dipping so lowly and then we had a very serious uh, um, uh, uh, recession in our economy. Egypt had the same problem with us, and it's, it remains a case study till tomorrow. Even for IMF, they, they refer to us with Egypt. Egypt had to do a very painful surgery by allowing their currency the value to meet up the Egyptian uh, uh, pounds or so. And then over the years, if you read the, 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 the analysis from Bloomberg and other, yeah, you know, yeah, and other they will tell you that what happened was that the economy got hurting temporarily. There was a spike in inflation, very horrible unemployment and, you know, all the economic effects of uh, such devaluation. But what happened eventually, you know, the rate normalized. Egypt today is Africa's foremost foreign direct investor and foreign you know, investment and foreign portfolio investment you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, attraction in the whole of Africa. All right? So people now find it comfortable to go in there to invest, to do business, knowing that the you currency is stable. Your, and IMF can out. also confidently give them a, any support and loan, knowing that they have done what they need to do to make the economy work more efficiently. Inefficient allocation of resources is a no-no anywhere in the country in economic terms. Right. And nobody wants to put money such an economy. All right, and today, Adam, Egypt has opened up their own inflow, yes. and things are a lot better there. Yes. Uh, inflation has stabilized. Inflows of FS is happening. And even the Egyptian dollar is also now 
strengthening against it. Right. Uh, the, uh, and, and all, we know the major battle now with most central bankers globally is, you know, inflation at this point. We're seeing, you know, the hawkish uh, moves from the Fed and, you know, the, the ECB. The ECB did leave Interest uh, theirs on, uh, on change, uh, you know, but uh, right here now we're seeing that uh, they're expecting some tightening, you know, from the Central Bank of Nigeria at some point. How do you see that happening? Nigerian economic managers must learn with our issues differently from what the rest of the world, you know, uh, does. Whatever they do, we must, we must not do to the same line. The European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the uh, US uh, Fed, they have the right to manage monetary policy, you know, with the assumption that, you know, uh, inflation is caused by demand pool, you know, uh, uh, levers. That is a lot of demand happening, you know, uh, people having so much, you know, they are, those, those are, cost push. those are, those are, you know, uh, what do you call them, um, uh, uh, debt or loan, credit for the economies, right? People borrowing a lot, you know, spike of, you know, purchases and domestic demand and all of that, and their prices are going up. And it happens that, you know, U.S. is battling with that inflation issue right now. And by the way, in U.S., trillions of dollars we are pumped in during COVID. Exactly. And all the money it's is falling around package, there. Right. Nobody got that kind of money here. So they have the right to tighten monetary policy by increasing CRL, finding a way to sell, you know, instruments and mop up money. Nigeria cannot afford to do that right now. Already, the cash reserve requirement in Nigeria is 27.5%, about the worst in the world. And when you trust, I don't have the time to explain all of that. I, I'm a teacher, by the way. I can make it simple for everybody. There's no time. By the time you calculate the impact of CRL and the liquidity ratio requirement, NDIC premium and all of that, the cost of fund in Nigerian banks today is humongous. And we all turn around to blame banks that they are the reason why the economy is not going. Why, why will you give me a uh, collect deposit at 3-4% uh, or 5% and you lend at 24? Uh, you are immoral. You are wicked. But what's going on here? You have 100 million from a customer. Let me do a brief uh, explanation of that. 100 million from a customer in the bank. Central bank takes 27.5 million as a 100 million and keep in their vault under Sierra. Paying you nothing is unremunerated. The central bank also says you must keep 30% in your vault. I mean, in your own vault or in any money market instrument. Again, that's how many, how many, how many percentage? 57.5. So the loanable fund you have from that 100 million is about 42 million. The central bank says you must turn back again to lend minimum of 65 million out of that 100 million. That's why all, almost all the banks are getting hit on the CRR penalty today. No bank can escape that. Because for you to meet, meet up that demand, you have to lend at the risky area, SME and so on, where they said they will you know, uh, weigh it for you at 150%, and they will also you know, do other things to enable you to uh, lend to the uh, agriculture and, and all of that. Banks have to now look for a certain fund on lending facility to be able to meet up. So tightening monetary policy means that loanable funds from any money banks collect from customers, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for my viewers to understand. If you tighten monetary policy, Interest rate will generally jump up differently. If you tighten by 200 basis points, that's 2%, banks must lend at whatever they're lending today plus 200 basis points. So you translate that to economy. An economy is struggling to survive. Manufacturing sector is very low today. Agri sector is not being uh, uh, utilized to bring out FX. We have an agri sector that is a bit dormant. Ag agricultural sector is the biggest uh, contributor to our GDP today. Quite right, no, quite right. But how much does it contribute to our FX earnings? We need funds at cheap level to process our agriculture uh, produce, to you know, post-harvest technology, process them, package them, you know, market them through the boards and so on, and make them available to the rest of Africa, to Europe, South America, and North America. That means we, we shouldn't expect. A, we don't. A, 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 I don't a hike expect. By no, the if, you, if you tighten monetary policy, you are further killing this economy while you fight inflation in Nigeria that is not demand pool driven. Nigeria economy, you know, inflation is driven by cost push, particularly foreign cost. We bring in a, 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 a little, uh, you know, the, the scarce US dollar that we bring in, you know, and it's not enough to meet import. That's why we are banning people. I, you know, CBN is saying, allocate, I can't allocate to you, I can't give you. But these guys are doing genuine business. You have not faulted their business. You haven't uh, canceled their business. You haven't said, don't bring in this thing. But you're saying, bring it in at your own, you know, um, um, headache. I won't give you a dollar. Where would they find the dollar? In the private market. So, you know, so inflation in Nigeria is driven by lack of uh, FX. How do we make FX available? Number one, why must we keep importing petroleum products, you know, prime motor, uh, motor spirits? PMS. You know, PMS and other uh, um, uh, crude oil uh, uh, products, as uh, uh, refined products, consume more than 40% of Nigeria's FX. How can we cut that off? Not depending only on Dangote. How can we quickly allow other investors, you know, invest in Nigeria's uh, refining industry?
we need to do that. That's a, um, uh, what do you call it again? Uh, uh, mystery, the mystery sector of the oil and right. gas industry. We need to do that quickly. And then how, how do we actually stop paying lip service to non-oil sector diversification to be able to bring in FX? The only major sort of FX today is a sector that contributes only about 7.8% of our economy, the oil and gas sector. How can't we open up the oil and, you know, the agriculture sector through important, you know, your, the colleague that, my colleague that spoke uh, a bit earlier, said government needs to f direct their grants and loans to the right, those anchor, to the right people yeah. who produce this crop, not political lists that you do. You are giving an uh, anchor boring to people. Today, that project, we don't hear much about that project anymore. CBN tried to mitigate, I mean, to help the economy by doing that, but they don't have the capacity, the staff strength to do that. How do they partner with other lending, you know, micro-lending institutions, even the commercial banks, at a very good level, where they will feel, feel you know, attracted to that scheme, to lend these things on their own? How many staff do the Central Bank have? Quite How many locations to be able to lend to individual farmers and follow it up? Those laws are today hugely delinquent. We have the facts. So government has to find a non-political, strategic, and you know, uh, uh, efficient way to make this money available to those parts of the economy, manufacturing sector, agricultural sector, you know, uh, telecom is doing well already, and other, you know, fishery and all those other uh, aspects. Of course, that's uh, right. part of agriculture. Right. How we can push funds there to generate more effects. When we do the the, the tightening of uh, you know the, the, the you know uh, of supply of FX, we're losing. When we have more supply, okay. our imports happen at a better price, and we don't have inflation going the way it's going. All right, okay. all right, Mr. Mr. Quite a lot to you know unpack there. Well, it, for us to do all of this, it has to be an invasive <laughs> surgery, and it's going <laughs> to be I'm a painful. I'm always willing. Just that you know, the kind process. of work we do, we're not always available. But right. anytime you call me, I'm available. Yes. We have to read this country very well, and as we go through this election year, you also find that you know talking about uh, Fitch rating, election year is a big negative for us. It is a big. We negative. want to want all politicians to please. Play down on money-backed politics. Right. For once, right. I beg Nigerians to get it All right. right. Thank you so, so we can much. have better leadership and bold uh, decision-making yeah. in this country. All right, Mr. Adumezwe, Oji Adumezwe, CEO of Flame Academy. It was great having you on the program today and uh, for you answering our call even on a holiday. Thank My you pleasure. so much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yep. All right. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll drill down on the markets. Just stay with us. This is Business Morning. <laughs> All right, now let's uh, drill down on the markets. We have uh, Will right there. Happy Good Friday, Will. <laughs> Happy Good Friday, laddie. Good morning. morning. Uh, we see that the bulls continue to dominate the equities market. Yesterday, we saw demand for MTN Nigeria. It was up about 0.9%. That's almost 1%. MTN Nigeria has been persisting. As in demand for that stock has been persisting since the CBN uh, announced, you know, the uh, approval for its uh, PSB, you know, the, the, the buying pressure service, has been incredible. You know, the buy, for yes, there's been, been increased buy pressure for that stock. And then the all share index, you know, has been advanced seen by 0.3% yesterday. Now, with month to date and yet today returns have increased phenomenally. We've seen 0.9% uptake for the, the month to date and the yet to date return has returned to the 10%. Now, we move to our ticker for today, analyst for today that's on our set to tell us what is driving the market, this sustained uh, you know, increase in the market. Good morning, on our set. Uh Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. So, the market has, you know, sustained gains for now four days now. What is really keeping this? What's sustaining this uh, positive trend in the market? All right. So um, let's let's start with what happened yesterday. Um, yesterday, the market increased by about forty basis points, um, and we saw rises in in stocks like Maya, um, um, Linka Shore, Mansard, Burger, and everything. And then, if if you go back a little bit at the beginning of the year. We saw um, the the buy to date increase, or, or in the month of January, we saw like an 8.3 percent increase increase in, in in you know um, the 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 NSE the buy to date. In February, we saw 0.6 percent. In March, we saw a negative 1 percent. Now we know that um, in the beginning, um, investors were trying to position themselves for like a uh, dividend yield, and then everybody expected, or at least a lot of people expected that okay, as we go into the year, um, yields according to you know, I mean, um, the market will continue to decrease due to, you know, election year effect. However, I believe that what we are seeing now is basically a game of fundamentals. Um, we just finished the first quarter and soon a lot of companies are going to be releasing quarterly results. And judging from what we've seen um, for the full year results that we've seen, we've seen a lot of positives in the full year results. We've seen, you know, tremendous growth from, from um, stocks like Guinness, Okomo Oil, Presco, um, 
MTN, Airtel, even Access Bank. So now I believe what investors are trying to do now, they're anticipating stocks that, you know, um, will post strong Q1 financials. And um, if there's one thing we know about the market is when, when you know, stocks and companies' financials actually meet or exceed analyst expectations, then the market rewards those stocks. Um, when they don't, the market punishes those stocks. And now we have particular stocks like MTN and even Airtel who, like you said earlier, you know, uh, the, the finalities on their PSB licenses has been, you know, basically given an okay. And so you have... Um, you know, those kind of stocks that have now have like an advantage in the market. And then, you know, investors look at these and, and see see these things as, you know, positive signs, you know. And so now you see a lot of people, you know, really rushing into the stocks uh, because they believe that, you know, they will push strong numbers, you know, and higher gains for, you know, at least the next, at least the next quarter. Mm. So, Nasa, we're probably looking forward to a green close today as well and uh, possibly a Good outlook for next week as well. Thank you so much, Anase. Yeah, Asotia Naolo, Investment okay. Research Analyst at Main Street Capital Limited. Thank you for joining us on the program. So, Ladi, it's a right. quick one, a brief one for the market. We've just seen how the bulls are going to probably, you know, drive in into today's trade and, you know, probably just give us the win for the week. Well, 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 it's a, it's, a, it's a holiday. Well, yes. we'll see. <laughs> Good <laughs> Friday I'm looking, holiday. We uh, yes, need to I'm looking the towards win, you know? uh, next week to see how uh, traders actually, you know, react to all these uh, gains that have been made. Thank you so much much will all right thank you will all right now let's uh head on to other markets we see uh we see the market uh, cap that's sitting at 1.87 uh, trillion for the crypto market we see fear grid index sitting at uh extreme uh fear this morning at 22 points let's bring in michael and Aji now uh to bring us up speed hello michael happy friday happy good happy friday, good friday. <laughs> great to have you again uh michael so uh the market has been quite you know interesting uh, this week, and we're seeing uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, and others, you know, set to invest about $400 million in USDC stablecoin uh, issuer. That's a circle. How, well, how are you seeing that investment? Uh, so it, it is a uh, monumental, uh, monumental shift in terms of uh, stablecoins, in terms of the institutional adoption of stablecoins. And what I mean by that is BlackRock is known as the uh, fund manager for institutions. Um, so uh, basically, like if you're an institution, a pension fund or whatever you may be, uh, BlackRock is most likely the place that you're going to manage your assets. They are a fund manager for institutions. So um, to see uh, BlackRock, one of the largest firms, um, asset management firms with over $10 trillion in assets under management, uh, inject uh, this much into circle. Um, it's really a sign of the things to come. Um, so basically, the 400 million is you know done in a strategic partnership. Um, they're investing the 400 million so that they can see how one thing is BlackRock will manage uh, USDC's uh, reserves. Um, so the all the US Treasuries and securities that are back the USDC will be managed by BlackRock. Also, as well, what they're trying to f uh, find out is how can they use USDC in capital market operations? So how can they implement um, stable coins in what BlackRock does on a daily basis? And how can they get synergies that, you know, improve their business? So it's a strategic partnership. Um, also, as well, Fidelity invested. But Fidelity has been in crypto for a while. Um, the, big, the big kicker here is BlackRock. And, you know, Larry Fink was, you know, is at the helm, and he was a little bit cautious. But he's always said that he wants to invest in the infrastructure, which USDC is, uh, being the fifth largest cryptocurrency by market cap. So, yeah, this is, uh, I think, finally. Quite the, interesting. Uh, we're, get, we're getting right. there, the institutional, institutionalization of stable coins in a private approach, not via a CBDC which is unique from every other country. So hopefully the private market wins the CBDC race um, rather than, you know, giving it to the federal government because we know governments are slow and inefficient when it comes to change. And it's usually handled better by private markets. Okay, well, uh, Michael, it, it, we've seen Bitcoin try to go up, come down uh, this week, not, not been a bullish uh, week for the market. And we've seen the Nasdaq also uh, impacted but, you know, looking at, we know the crypto market doesn't close. No holidays, you know, in that market is open. It's trading right now. How are you seeing the weekend play for a Bitcoin price action? I think there should be like a relief rally, maybe to 43, 44K. 
but I still think there's more low, uh, more more downturn um, in front of us. I still think the lower 30Ks will be tested. Ultimately, we should end up somewhere closer to 24 to 30K in the next uh, three to four months. But then that should be the final bottom that allows us to go to six figures. But I, I do believe there is going to be a, a washout in all global markets soon. Um, that's uh, as, uh, that's uh, equities commodities you name it any kind of market they will be a come to, come to uh come to jesus moment um just where people <laughs> realize that they need to get out of the markets and be in cash cash is king right now because um, right. that will allow you to pounce on opportunities uh when they do come because all the like, the fed is going to hike interest rates 50 basis points for the next two or three meetings and every six, six out of i think six out of seven times that they've done that has always right. led into a recession so it would be dumb to pretend that, you know, we don't have a recession looming. Um, so I really do think all global markets are are, are, are risky uh, right. in terms of the next couple of months. And the best place to be in is heavily cash, at all least right. not, 80 not a, to 85 percent. No, no, not the right uh, kind of market for uh, short term uh, traders at this point. All right, Michael, always great to talk to you. Enjoy the weekend, Michael. Thank you so much, Laddie. Have a great weekend. Happy all Easter. Right. Happy Easter. All right. So, uh, well, that's it uh, for the uh, crypto market and the show for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Remember to join us at 134 uh, Business Incorporated for more updates in the world of business. Happy Good Friday. Bye-bye.